This is episode 162. And before we begin, I would like to recommend a podcast. It is titled The Hunter Conservationist Podcast. And it is just incredible how many common themes we share. Um, so The Hunter Conservationist Podcast talks, like we are, about wildlife, science, conservation, and responsible hunting in Canada. So even though the podcast is specific to Canada, you wouldn't believe how many common themes and common guests even we have. So for example, uh, in episode 159, we were talking about polar bears with Dr. Andrew Desrochers. And it turns out that Andrew was guest on the Hunter Conservationist podcast a couple of months, uh, a few good few months uh, ago. And also, one of the recent guests on the Hunter Conservationist podcast will be our guest on here on Tommy's Outdoors Conservation and Science. And if you can guess who that guest is, um, I will send you a Tommy's Outdoors hat or Tommy's Outdoors t-shirt, whatever you want, okay? So go in there, check the Hunter Conservationist podcast, and if you get, if you can guess, you know, if you just look at the titles, but if you listen, it's a dead giveaway because these folks are just speaking open text about being on my podcast. So if you can guess who is going to be the guest on, on my podcast, who was already guest on the Hunter Conservationist podcast, again, I'll send you a, a t-shirt or hat. Um, is it going to be like hundreds of you who will send the correct answer? I will do the raffle. Um, but if there's going to be um, as many of you as I have uh, hats and t-shirts left, I'll just send you whichever one you prefer, t-shirt or hat. Okay, so send me an email. For, sorry, first, check the Hunter Conservationist podcast. Obviously, on this very platform that you're listening uh, to this podcast, there are they there as well. And then send me an email. Now, if you're wondering how to send me an email, well, that means that you are not subscribed to my newsletter which is a big mistake. So uh, go to the description of this show and subscribe to my newsletter. There's a link to the newsletter there, newsletter.tomisoutdoors.com. Subscribe to the newsletter and any email you get as a newsletter, just hit the reply and that email gets directly to my inbox, okay? And I'm going to reply to that. So um, yeah, so that's uh, this short plug. Uh, again, the Hunter Conservationist podcast by all means check check these folks out they're they're doing great job and now we are moving on with our episode and today's episode is another episode where we talk about farming farming is a very important part of conservation efforts and protection of nature and wildlife uh, because it's a uh, one of the key land use okay and our guest today is the one and only Susanna Crampton. And Susanna is one of the most recognizable figures in Irish agriculture. She's a sheep farmer. You may know her as Svartplas Ireland or Zwarbles Ireland. I think I'm doing a pretty decent job uh, pronouncing that as a Dutchman. Svartplas. I think that's a proper pronunciation. So anyway... Um, I was delighted to actually go to Susanna and meet her at her farm. So she's guest on our podcast and I was guest at her farm. I always love those arrangements. Um, and you can hear during the uh, recording, you can see some knocking on the microphones and, and, and K rubbing on cables because there were dogs running around, sometimes having disagreements and cats, and they were sometimes touching microphones or equipment, and that's what you can hear from time to time. Um, so going back to what we talked about, we talked about farming with nature. We talked about uh, soil health. We talked about rewilding as well. So if you are curious like what is the deal with sheep farming is the sheep farming only results in sheep wrecked landscapes and they're only viable because it's a subsidy harvest then the answer is clearly no because susanna has a very rich biodiverse farm and i can attest that because uh, before we sat down to record a podcast we were walking around her farm and she was showing me stuff in there 
And also her farm is viable economically without any subsidies. So that might be interesting um, to all of you, some of you who are farmers, then obviously that's going to be interesting to you. Although I have a suspicion that you already know, Susanna. And those of you who are just interested in ecology and conservation and biodiversity and want to hear, um, let's say, not the same common narratives about uh, sheep farming and farming in general, this episode is for you. I had a blast uh, being at her farm and I'm sure you will have a blast listening to our conversation. Enjoy. Susanna, hello, welcome to the show. Hello, hello, hello. Lovely to have you here on the farm, Tommy. Lovely to, to have you on the podcast and thank you for invitation. Uh, I always, you know, most of the podcasts are recorded online, but I always welcome invitation to go somewhere and meet people in person. And uh, so, yeah, anyone who like who I can travel to, and obviously I can cover all Ireland outside of Ireland. We see, I always happy to travel. So, thank you for the invitation to your farm, to your house. We you just gave me such a wonderful tour over on the farm. You are just walking encyclopedia of all the plants. No, well, I learn every day. It's always about learning more and more and more. Absolutely. Susanna, we're going to, we, it's a it's a face-to-face -face interview, but we're going to do what we always do on this podcast. So we're going to jump right in, into the deep end, into the thick of it. Okay. Right. We are on a sheep farm. And yes. when we talk about sheep farming uh, in the context of the environment and the biodiversity, sheep farming as a practice and sheep farmers are getting... It's something that I can only describe as hate. My words, not yours, right? It's so you you take she's here. Take a sheep over the hill. Uh, landscape sheep wrecked. Uh, it's only subsidies harvest. Uh, woolly maggots, etc., etc. How do you feel when you hear those comments? Well. Uh, to be honest, I really understand that a lot of people don't understand the environment in which you farm sheep depends on how you farm the sheep, uh. if that makes any sense. So you do have the subsidies sheep. Uh, you do have people who overgraze land. It is very much dependent on how you manage the land for the biodiversity, uh, the hills and mountains, there are heathers. Heathers don't like woodland and there's a lot of wildlife in amongst heathers. Uh, it's basically based on how you manage the land to be an environmentally friendly farmer because the herbivore manure, if we want to get basic about it, the shit, is really important and the manure drives biodiversity. When it is correctly managed, every species of insect is in pursuit of what it needs to be a sustainable living species. And that means that with the manure, you have butterflies, bees, dung beetles, uh, moths all go and feed on healthy manure for their microbial and microsial life. And you have to think that those insects are just above the actual base baseline of what a healthy biodiverse environment is. The next layer down, the base of all life on Earth is a healthy soil biome. Mm. The next level is the insect life, be that worms, dung beetles, be, uh, uh, any other kind of beetles or ants or any of the life that's involved in the soil. And the next layer up would be the plant life. And the next layer up would be the herbivores, with, which are the drivers of a healthy soil biome. And the insect life is vital to birds, bats, hedgehogs, badgers, etc., as well as with the livestock or animals or herbivores, whatever you want to call it, to do with their also with 
their um, health and diversity as well, because the soil, healthy soil drives a healthy plant life. A healthy plant life does healthy animals that eat it, which then in turn shit out healthy shit, which the insects eat. Then you have the healthy birds, the hedgehogs, etc. It is a cyclical thing. And when it is farmed and managed correctly, you have incredible biodiversity. I mean, we have species here of insect life and bats and birds that are considered rare in Ireland. I actually have um, uh, tawny mining bees, which were written in a book a number of years ago as being extinct in Ireland. And I had to flag it and I had to say, excuse me, we have tawny mining bees here and we have loads of them. And the individual said, oh, well, um, you should have told Biodiversity Ireland. And I said, well, actually, they know and it's recorded. And I was one of the first <laughs> places that were recorded that we have tawny mining bees. So the nuance that's needed in how to farm with the environment and to uh, have a biodiverse area of plant and animal life is driven by the health of the soil, which is driven by the health of the manure of, yes, the worms and the beetles, but also the dung beetles, which drive the nutrient cycle because plants can't move, mm. but a herbivore can. And with their, with their movement, the manure moves. And when the manure moves, the plants get a lot of fertility that they need to keep moving forward and to reproduce and to feed the next level of the insects, which feed everything else. It's all tied in and cyclical and you can overdo it just yeah. like you can have too many kangaroos or too many deer or too many um, sharks or too many something that is a predominant species like humans. Yeah, <laughs> that's a different. That's a different topic. So just just to finish off on this, so your your what I'm getting from you is that basically there are sheep farming practices that are damaging to the environment, and there are sheep farming practices that are can be beneficial to the environment. Yes, so absolutely. there is so there is, so there is so there is some merit to saying like, oh, this landscape is overgrazed or is it you know destroyed by the sheep? The problem is that it's getting generalized, like all the sheep. Yes, okay. yes. The generalization, the practice of generalization, either for agriculture, farming, or for environmentalism, is none of this is black and white hmm. and shouldn't be treated black and white. There is incredible nuance. I mean, we have the, in Ireland, we have the horseshoe bat and the, um, uh, Chuff, both animals that are uh, on the endangered list, yeah. both of whom are dependent on dung beetles. And you need to have healthy dung beetles to have healthy populations of these mammals yeah. or birds. Sorry, um, a chuff is a bird and the bat is a mammal. So you you need there needs to be a balance and something that i've been doing for years and years and years is what i would call essentially farming for dung beetles oh. because that would be a baseline for a lot of when they emerge out of the soil is when bats are weaning so their babies baby bats would love a bumbling dung beetle to eat because it's a high value protein and they come up in the dusky evening, just when the bats are exiting and the mother has abandoned its baby and said, now I've been feeding you my milk for ages. You now have to go and fend for yourself. Mm -hmm. And they go and they find these bumbling dung beetles who fly around. There are ones that are daylight, but there's a, the bigger ones. The door dung beetles are emerge from their larvae status from the soil, come up and are flying around. And they're the perfect meal for mm -hmm. baby bats who are being weaned off of the high protein rich milk and now are um, have to go and survive. And um, there's a whole series of other insects that emerge around the time. Just, just for, for the listeners, like dung beetles, it's not like a species named dung beetles. There are many types of dung we beetles. We have 40 different kinds of dung beetles now. 40. 40, four zero. 
And, or put it this way, we used to have. No. Now, because of agricultural animal practices, of using insecticides that you pour on the animals, of injectable parasitical things that you inject in animals or that you dose orally in animals. And this includes your household pet getting the flea and tick dose on the back of their neck. Because the dung beetle will clean up the dog poop or the cat poop or the sheep poop or the deer poop or the cow poop, all these kind of things, and then they get weakened. But it's not only the dung beetle that eats the dung that has been full of the um, insecticide because you have bees do it, honeybees do it, yeah. individual bees do it, uh, bumblebees do it, butterflies do it, moths do it, um, all different kinds of animals consume manure because of its incredible richness and so i am very aware of this and have been for years and uh i had a brilliant thing occurred this year for example because it's a combination for parasites mm -hmm. that you have internally uh for cows and horses and sheep and goats etc all those kind of herbivore animals that are graze there are a variety of different worms that uh, if you have plant tannins, plants with tannins in them, that will uh, prevent the worm from shedding its skin. So it starves to death inside the animal and then it's pooped out and it's dead. Oh. Okay, so you have the plant tannin, the plants with tannins, because I farm a multi-species sward, which is a real diversity of herbs and grasses and legumes. So there's the plant tannin effect for the parasitical worm, but there is also the dung beetle has little mites. So when the dung beetle is flying around to the new new bit of manure, the mite hops off and it consumes fly larvae, fly eggs, worm larvae, and worm eggs. So that's a twofold way of eliminating the parasite in livestock. On top of that, the plant tannins have two flushes of growth, which are both at the same time that you have the flush in spring of parasitical worms and the flush in autumn of parasitical worms. So the plant tannins are there. The plants with the tannins are there to prevent an overpopulation burden of parasitical worms. So you can farm without the doses. Now, this year, I had the vet came and what they do is there's this now routine where the vet comes to your farm and they go and they collect manure and it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. And they go and analyze it and they say, okay, you uh, need to dose them with this or that, the other. The vet phoned me up and said, um, I'm really sorry. I don't know what to say. And I said, what do you mean you don't know what to say? And they said, well, you don't have any parasitical worms in your flock. And I was like, well, that's a great thing, isn't it? I'm doing the right thing. Why can't you just advise me and tell me that I'm doing the right thing and keep doing what I'm doing? And she said, but that's not veterinary advice. And I said, but that's preventative medicine. I am doing the right thing, farming the dung beetles, having the multi-species sward with plants and tannins and all the rest of it in, and that my sheep are really healthy naturally without veterinary input of doses or injectables or porons. And she said, yes, but... I, as a vet, can't advise you to continue doing that. So I have to send you a letter, and she did subsequently send me a letter uh, about, you know, uh, that I have to keep an eye on this, that, and the other, and, you know, rotate my wormers and all these other kinds of things. And I was going like, oh, oh okay. That's, that's, one of, that's one of those things, right, where the established machinery is not even close to uh look uh, i just i just want to just to finish off the on the on the on the sheep farming so do you do you feel like an association with like a other sheep farmers like i'm a sheep farmer and then subsequently do you feel like oh lads you're doing like a shit job at shop farming at sheep farming because look how bad publicity we're getting because of your practices no in as much as my education to do with the environment and farming was all the way back in the 1980s. The educational system and the financial system that farmers are held to account within 
the confines of what they're held to account within, has educated them to farm this way and to earn their living this way. So you can't say they're doing it wrong because they're doing it right as they have been educated to do it. So the thing is to see what they're doing right. It's the power of the positive. Mm. This whole negativity of negatively attacking, making negative about this, that, and the other, you get nowhere beating people over the head. Psychologically, mentally, verbally, any of those things, you do not get anywhere. You People then put up the wall and say, yeah. go away. I don't want to listen to you. You are just being negative. I don't need you in my life. What you need to do and what a lot of these kind of things need to do is actually find the positive, feed the positive, and bring the positive to what people can do. Now, do understand that I farm here and I get no government funding. I get no EU funding. I am earning a living on a very small sheep farm, but that's because I diversify and I have a value added product at the end with both my meat and my wool, which is turned into wool, yarn and blankets, et cetera, et cetera. And I have the tour groups. So it's a diverse kind of income that I've derived from my farm. And I have no off-farm income. Mm -hmm. But a lot of farmers, their income is based on the subsidy system, which they've been educated into and which they are confined to. So there's no sense in attacking them. Rather, why not get people to learn how to do it otherwise in a positive way? So if you're, is there like... Uh let's say the sheep farmer is listening to this podcast right now what advice would you would you give those those folks who just you know they're 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 seeing things that are happening that are maybe not great and it's like ah, but they're already locked in into this cycle into this right this is this is how i know what would be your real advice you know where to how how to even start how to set them on the path of farming with nature the biodiversity the kind of fixing the problems that are with sheep farming and, and moving them closer to what you know model that you're doing. Which is both viability of a farm, which is very important as well. Because Hugely the, important. Because at the end of the day, that's the job they need to earn a living. But, you know, so what's uh, what, what would be the advice? There, there is so many different things to do. Um, one is learning about multi-species sward, because then you don't have to use artificial fertilizer. Um, that would be a lot of lowland sheep farmers. I would advise that too. Uh, it is a management change in system as well in that it is not set grazing. Set grazing means you turn the sheep out into the field and leave them there for four months. Mm -hmm. You have to actually divide them off and move and rest paddocks and things like that, and rest fields and allow the plant life to reseed itself and resow itself. And you can do that. I'm farming this on 14 acres and you can do it if you adapt your system to it and you're understanding it. There is so much literature out there that is not Irish based about how to farm more for sheep more environmentally friendly. There are a lot of farmers who are practicing it besides myself. So you, and there are places in the world that are wetter than Ireland. I always hear people say, oh, sure, but you know, Ireland's so wet, we can't uh, do this practice because we're so wet. There are places that are a lot wetter than Ireland that are pr farming with nature and uh, doing these environmental practices. Uh, for Irish farmers, one of the things I would suggest would be get in touch with Cotswold Seeds, look at their website and see what they're doing there with their multi-species sward. The, um, the Irish government uh, has a multi-species sward that they will help fund, but 
My advice there would be it is only seven different species. You want 15 to 25 because the Irish government advised one does not include plants with tannins in it. And you want the plants with the tannins in it to balance out the legumes to help with the grasses. So I would in increase the number of species if you're going to sow the multi-species award. Get the government subsidy, but then add in more species uh, to the diversity, as well as your land is already, if you will, a kind of drug addict to the artificial fertilizer. So it's like a human. If they're addicted to a drug like cocaine or something, you have to bring them off of it slowly. If you do an immediate cut and changeover, the soil is going to go like, ah, what have you done? And your land will go backwards. Whereas if you slowly move paddock through paddock, there's I've been working with other sheep farmers and dairy farmers and um, mixed tillage and beef farmers uh, over a number of years. And it's, you know, it's a slow process to transition. And what's really interesting is a lot of those farmers are now saying, God, I wish I did this sooner. Yeah. This is so magnificent. No artificial fertilizer, no herbicide, no insecticides. And how when everything incredibly balances back. Yeah. And there's there's a beef farmer I've been working with uh, just up the road here. And he uh, inherited this wonderful acreage of tillage. And he asked me what I should do, what he should do. And he was thinking just, you know, and I said, look, do an incredible multi-species sward. Make sure you have the really deep rooters like chicory and yarrow and um, uh, salad burnets in the mix because they'll break the compaction because this has been fields that had been in tillage for many, many, many years. So there'd be huge layers of compaction and there would be no organic matter. And he said it was phenomenal within four months Oh. the wildlife and biodiversity in the field. And he's been grazing through it in his in this kind of uh, mob grazing fashion, his beef cattle. Mm -hmm. And he said the soil was amazing. It is possible to do it, but you're working against a farmer's fear of failed experimentation. So if you work it slowly over a number of years, you then get to understand. There was a beef farmer I was talking to last year, and he was working through it slowly. Uh, it was the first time I'd met him. He was being advised by somebody else, not myself. And he uh, fertilized one field, and he had a spin of fertilizer for one length of the multi-species sward he planted. And he said, sure, I don't want to waste it. So he did the one length, one strip of the multi-species sward. Uh, and within, I think it was a few weeks or months, he could see the difference of where he fertilized. It was a retardation in growth versus where he hadn't. There was a huge, incredible growth. And he said, that was the best lesson learned. And to me, you, you, need to experiment on your land to see what works for your land specific to your kind of animals, etc. Because in Ireland, there's so many different kinds of lands. There is a huge diversity. There's we here on this farm, we have areas where the soil is, you know, maybe an inch thick, and then it's limestone slab. And then we have areas where it's really deep. We have areas where it's kind of boggy and areas where it's not. So we don't have a universally lowland, beautiful grass sward here. So there's a huge diversity. And each one of those areas needs a different kind of management system. And it's to understand seeing how to manage the land to be beneficial for both you as a farmer getting an income for your animals and for the soil and for the biodiversity. And it is a big ask, a huge ask, to ask somebody to do that who has been educated and financed and subsidized under an agricultural chemical system. And so you, it is very much show them the results of other farmers, educate them, show them the science that is out there, the books, the videos, 
uh, and that this is absolutely possible. And the podcast, I have to, I have to mention, like on episode 144, we talked to James Foley, which I know yeah. you were advising him as well. <laughs> and uh, and when, when, when in our interview, he was saying the similar thing. I wish I had done it earlier. Yeah. And also the process of experimenting and going slowly, and then like if I knew. I would go faster and bigger. But he still had to experiment because he was afraid of it. Yes. And I mean, I would keep saying, no, James, you're okay. You're doing the right thing. Go slowly and experiment. And, you know, it's, I don't want to take huge credit for it because he'd been thinking about it for years before he got in touch with me and we would have these conversations. But I think he is thrilled to bits yes. with how it's turned out and evolved now. And as a dairy farmer, he hasn't had to decrease his stocking rate, but his biodiversity of insect life and plant life has exploded yeah. on his farm. So um, it is completely possible. But I think a lot of modern chemical engineering farmers need to experiment to understand where and what they're going into. Because if they don't, and they just do a complete conversion, they won't know the difference. So if you have the multi-species sword, do one strip of fertilizer so that you yourself can see. I think the, I mean, the best farmers are always those farmers who are innovators. And farmers are innovators and moving with the times. And there are loads of them out there doing all kinds of amazing things, be they beef, dairy, tillage, um, sheep, et cetera, et cetera. So, or mixed, uh, th there, there's a podcast you're going to have to do is go to Mark Burnett up in uh, Monaghan. He's right. beef and tillage and he creates his own uh, flour and he uses the cows as a fertility component for the soil. He's He farms the soil biome to produce his tillage. So he's on a rotation with his beef cattle through his tillage land with multi-species uh, swords, clovers, and then he does a multi-crop technique where he's got uh, if it's oats or wheat, and then there's beans or peas grown with them so that there is no, so he literally sows the field, does not go into it until it's harvested because huh. there's no fungicide, no herbicide, no insecticide, no fertilizer, no lime balancing because the soil, when you farm for the soil biome, it balances it out. There's a fantastic video that I uh, share with a lot of farmers. It's a talk by this amazing woman called Dr. Christina Jones. And it's called The Phosphate Dilemma in that one of the things that a lot of farmers, oh, we won't have enough phosphates if we just let the multi-species sward do it. And she gives a talk about how when you have the multi-species sward and all the different root structures they rebalance the soil. This is what James found this out. Is what, this is what is James it his was... pH? He mm -hmm. was all worried about his pH. And then he got soil tested and it was perfect. And it was like, how did that happen? And then, I mean, no, it, he wasn't quite like that because he kind of knew <laughs> that he was on that road. So I apologize, James. Shout out to James. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it's, it's the, so if we farm with nature for the soil biome, the basics of life itself is the soil. Yeah. It all balances out and we can eat enough. Yeah. And there isn't this problem of not enough food to feed the world population. There is, there's more than enough food at the moment to feed everybody. Yes. Yes. So the folks, uh, again, if you're interested, uh, episode is 144. If you uh, want to check this one after finishing listening to this one. Yes. Okay. okay so we talk about the these practices in the soil and we talk about also a lot of bad farming practices would you agree with assessment that as we are right now the farming is the biggest driver of biodiversity loss again something that you hear quite often would you agree with that and what nuance or caveats would you sorry the dogs are having a disagreement um it's a heated subject here. So. It's a very heated subject. And I think there's a lot of nuance. For example, here in Ireland, 
agriculture is being blamed for over fertilization of stuff and the runoff on the rivers and everything, right? Mm -hmm. Here in Ireland, how they address how much fertilizer is spread in the country is how much fertilizer is bought, okay? That includes all the gardeners, the parks, recreational facilities, the golf courses, all those different things, as well as the farmers. Yet, when you hear the farmers being blamed for too much fertilizer, you don't hear anything about the golf courses which over-fertilize in a huge way and would have this year because they have been doing a lot of mowing because it's been ideal weather for growing grass. So the golf courses are mowing regularly, so they're fertilizing regularly. Now, there's a lot going on about, um, what is it in the West, uh, Loch Derg. Yes. What is at the top of Loch Derg? Is it a golf course? Lots of golf courses. There is a whole series of golf courses. Now, in saying that, I am not saying that agricultural farm practices aren't at play, but nobody is looking at the golf courses as an issue where they do a huge amount of, they, the grasses they have have tiny root structures because they're all fertilized. When you're a gra grass platform, is growing rapidly, you have to mow it a lot. When you mow it a lot, you're taking off the nutrient value. So you have to fertilize it a lot. So when it's raining a lot, you have to keep putting the fertilizer on to grow for the people to walk on there and play their golf. So there would be a huge amount of wash of artificial fertilizer off of that golf course. But, but there would also be a huge wash of herbicide because the golf course doesn't want the dandelions it doesn't want the herbs it doesn't want the legumes growing in their in their finely mown sward so i think in this country there the nuance of what is defined as a farming problem there should be a division in fertilizer uses as well as in sewage, because that is also seen as uh, classed as farming. So mm. if the gates of a sluice is open and the um, uh, human uh, excrement is in the rivers, that is not necessarily classed as sewage. It is still a farming byproduct because it is a farming byproduct, because whatever you eat was farmed. <laughs> so it is a farming byproduct. So the nuance of pointing fingers should be reclassified and understood. And go look at the top of Loch Derg. What is there? A whole series of golf courses. Don't you think that the land area covered by golf courses is way is un uncomparably i just i just don't want the listeners to get from with the impression that the golf courses are now the big problem oh, the, no, 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 no no that's not that's not because acreage wise acreage right? wise yeah there would be a lot more um farms uh you know tillage farms and animal farm you know dairies and sheep and goat etc there's a lot of those out there and a lot of forestry uses a lot of fertilizer as well so i mean it's there there is a problem there is also a problem with novel entities and plastics and environmentally there are a plethora of issues don't get me wrong uh it's something that, because uh, it's something that I've been aware of for decades, it is something that, you know, when I was growing up here, the wildlife was amazing. Uh, the hedgehogs were everywhere, the badgers were everywhere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's a lot less of it when I go on to other farms and things like that. I, um, a lot of hedgerows are pulled out, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's also a huge um, 
thing about carbon sequestration in that a multi-species sward would sequester a higher percentage of carbon than a woodland. And you say, oh, that's not possible. How can that be? When you have root depths that get up to several meters and you have things called root exudates that shed in the soil and remain in the soil, and the deeper the roots, the more root exudates are shed, the more plants, the more these are shed, the more that is sequestered. Then you have sequestered carbon is an issue in that the assessment of whether it is a animal overgrazing or is it an animal that is sequestering carbon as it's producing meat or milk or wool and it's shitting back into the soil and doing the cycle. There is the closed cycle of nutrients going around. And this, there's that closed cycle of carbon. A lot of the environmentalists, oh, yeah, but, 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 but. And it's like, it is the management system in which you practice that can sequester more carbon. So if you're just doing the artificial fertilizer, you are not sequestering as much carbon if you have the multi-species sward. And so with tillage, for example, a lot of tillage farms in Ireland, wheat, barley, corn, uh, rape, potatoes, broccoli, all these kind of things, they're plowing the soil. As soon as you plow the soil, you're releasing a huge amount of carbon. A lot of the farmers, unless they're organic, are artificially fertilizing the soil. Now, we have to remember what I said at the very beginning is soil biome. That's the vital important thing. When you take out of soil and you grow something, you're extracting the carbon from the soil. So a seed gets planted. The sun and the water and the artificial fertilizer fertilizes it to grow. The extraction from the soil is the carbon growing in the plant. So that plant is the carbon that is extracted from the soil. But then that field is plowed again, more artificial fertilizer, and you are continuously extracting carbon from the soil and harvesting it and we're eating that broccoli. That soil is decreasing in volume and is becoming compacted with over tillage and overuse. The carbon has exited. The water has exited. The nutrients have exited all through the plants. So you are sucking the life's blood out of the soil through artificial means. The microbial life is gone. The mycorrhizal life is all gone from that soil into that plant. And then that plant becomes nutrient deficit to you because the soil that it's extracting from has less and less and less and less nutrient value to you because there's no microbial or microbial life. If you bring animals back into the equation and do a rotational system of tillage practices, whether it's no-till or mini-till or whatever, you are restoring the soil biome because What's in your stomach, my stomach, the dog's stomach, the cat's stomach, the cow's stomach, the sheep's stomach is a biome. And what those herbivores are shitting out is resuscitating the soil nutrient to feed the plant that feeds us. So you need the rotation of the animals to rejuvenate the soils, because if you continuously extract the nutrients out of the soil, we end up having a diet deficient in a huge number of micronutrients, which is one of the reasons why I'm very against hydroponic vegetable growing and fruit growing systems, because you are producing food under an artificial way that is nutrient deficient. And this is something that they're discovering in a lot of, there's a lot of research now about um, analyzing people's uh, waste, et cetera, et cetera. And it's fascinating how um, uh, so many micronutrients are now missing in our diets because the microbial, microbial life in the soil has been 
extracted to such an extreme. It was uh, interesting. I uh, was doing one of my farm tours. I do these farm tours. And I was talking about how um, we are being depleted of so many micronutrients that there is a fertility issue in a lot of Western societies, in the richer societies, because we've become so uh, enamored in clean food. The food is so clean, it doesn't have what we need in it to be healthy fertile human beings and add and, microplastic to that and uh, add microplastics to that and all the drugs and all the blah 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 all those kind of um uh, novel entities novel entities which, that's a very w nice way to put it well, it's, it's, novel entities but there's so many of them there's the drugs there's the plastics there's uh, all kinds of novel entities that are polluting our systems as well as the soil as well as the sea and the rivers etc anyway so there was this gentleman and I was talking about how, you know, infertility is getting becoming more and more of a huge issue. And he suddenly was doing this kind of smile at me. And I was like, what is it? And he says, do you know what I do? And I was like, no, I don't. And he works for a pharmaceutical company that has established a wing of it to do with infertility. And I said, I bet you've seen in the last 15 years an explosion. And he said, yes. And it's really good for the company. And it's what's interesting is that infertility, a lot of people will not talk about it because it's an embarrassment, whether it's the man or the woman in the, in the equation that's infertile. They will go and secretly find a fertility clinic somewhere to, to do what they need to do to have babies. And it's a massive issue. And the, then there was another woman I had here. She was a, a, a doctor in uh, bowel and stomach cancers. And she was asking me these kind of questions. And I was talking, you know, really look into microbiology and uh, microbial and microbial life and all, you know, healthy soils and where we need to get our nutrition from and the closed cycle of the importance of the manures as well as the soil, et cetera, et cetera. And she was saying that there, she's a, cancer for the bowel and the intestine. And she said, now, in part, this has to do with over-processed foods. Ultra-processed foods are hugely detrimental to our health. Hugely. Again, to our gut biome, like you said. Exactly. The, this is like probably the most important thing about is our, our gut health, biome. Is our gut biome, which gets developed based on what we eat. And to your point, if we eat something that is just depleted of all those things, we have no opportunity to develop. <laughs> exactly. And she was saying, this is, she's based here in Ireland, and she was saying that the age for the cancers, be it bowel or stomach, she said, it is very scary how many young people now are coming down with these cancers because it's a multi-generational system of depleted nutrients because the soil doesn't have it anymore. And this is why we need the livestock in the rotation. I totally disagree with intensive agriculture, be it tillage or animal. What we need is the nuance of the mixture of all of these into growing our food. Here's another example. So I built a, uh, renovated a, uh, a kind of greenhouse that I call the vine house that my great grandfather built. It had died and I redid it a couple of years ago. And then um, last summer was the first year that I had loads of seedlings uh, of tomatoes that I could grow. And I use my shed manure, which is wood chip, straw, and manure. And I do a lasagna thing of straw, manure, wood chip, manure, straw. So that's where winter housing for the sheep and the horses, etc. cetera. And uh, it composts in the shed. And then at the end of the season, I put it out in the field and it does its composting thing for a year. And then I use that in my vegetable garden and to grow my tomatoes. So last year was the first year that I could grow from seed the tomatoes. And um, 
I exchanged with another friend of mine who's had a polytunnel for the last 25 years and grown tomatoes and everything. And we exchanged. So we both had the exact same tomatoes. And she came over last summer and had lunch and I had a tomato salad and she was eating the tomato salad and she was like, why do your tomatoes taste so much better than mine? And we couldn't figure it out. And we were racking our brains. She uses the uh, compost teas of borage and um, um, what are they? Nettle. And uh, there's another one to for the fertility and the potassium that the tomatoes need. Mine was on the manure straw wood chip mixture. Mine had the microbial microsial life. That was the only difference between her tomatoes taste delicious. Don't get me wrong. Homegrown tomatoes are the best. But the dip that she noted the difference and couldn't figure out why the same tomatoes tasted better here than over at her place. I was like, oh, well, maybe it's because I prepared them and you didn't, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, it's like it's always eating out is yeah, always yeah, yeah, more yeah. delicious because you don't have to do the washing up. Yeah, it's that yeah, kind yeah. of a thing. But no, it was, that's the difference is our body craves the healthy feed that feeds our biome and it's in the flavor as well. That's, you know, that's a, and, and this is, gives a nice segue to, to talk about another item, which is like a food and the connection with food, because this is, you know, I, I read, uh, I don't, it might have even been Isabella Stree's book about the rewilding or wilding title. Maybe, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I read about how, how cows, their self-medicate eating different different uh, grasses and 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 plants and so on and then how that in turn changes their hormonal system and that how that in turn changes their fat content and fat in the and that in turn how that changes our you know fat and how our brain works and all that and that was probably the moment where i, I like fully realize how difficult it is to get healthy food I, I i seriously mean that and it, it, so where i where i go with that is this sort of disconnection that most of uh people probably not the listeners of the podcast but but a lot of people have disconnection with the food where the food comes from and like what what is it and it's more to the tomato or to the meat than just this object that you're buying because that is actually that came from somewhere, right? And and probably that's also my biggest um, issue or question with the with the cultured meat and all that. You know, like it's it's not it's not enough that you have a cells that are the same as the cells of the like. Just think about the whole life cycle that those cells came through during the life of the animal. They're not doing this when you're growing meat in a in a in a lab, right? So. I don't know. It's not really a question. It's more of a, like a conversation point about about food and uh, how hard it is to get a good food. Because if if you don't, if you live like in the city and you don't know a farmer, and it's damn hard to get a good food. But there are a lot of good farmers out there, both in the UK here in Ireland, who will sell their meat and ship them to you. So I mean, it's like. When I buy pork, I know the farmer I'm going to be buying it from, and I know it's free range. And I also know that farmer will ship it to you if you want it. Or if I'm going to, well, I do my own eggs. So, but I know where I'm going to go and buy my chicken uh, is from a farmer where the chickens are out, not only free ranging, but they're out in fields eating grass. That's the important thing is that they are getting the real soil biome. For example, when you have any baby herbivore, kid, lamb, foal, calf, when they are born, they inhale and ingest a bit of fecal matter from their parent. In the first week of life, you really want them outside because 
for two reasons. One, they are going to eat some of their parents' manure to activate the biome in their own stomach. Two, because you will see them eating soil to again activate their biome in their stomach. These are 100% natural things that the animal does instinctively. Like you were saying about, which is something that I've observed for years, is animals self-medicating. When they're feeling under the weather, you can tell by the body language, and I go and observe what that animal is eating. And there was so often years ago, I would be going, looking through my books and saying, okay, that plant has X, Y, Z, what's wrong with that sheep or horse mm. or whatever? What are they looking for in that uh, why are they eating that celandine? Why are they eating so much of that thistle? Why are they eating so much of that dock plant? What are they looking for? And then you can kind of understand what might be wrong with them so that you can either help them or down the road observe to find access for them of particular herbs so they can self-medicate. I'll give you another example. This year, I had a yo who had, uh, she had twin lambs. She was fine, blah, da da. Suddenly, I go out there one day and she's on three legs. And I'm like, oh no. And I look at the foot, I look at the hip, I look at the leg. I, I can't tell if anything's broken. I, the way she's walking, maybe she's dislocated it. And I'm like, okay, I can't do this on my own. So I call the vet. The vet comes and assesses her. She is not dislocated. There is no broken bone, both of which I kind of had assessed. And we, she didn't have foot rot or scald, which are the two kind of sheep things that happen with feet. And he took his fingernail, and which I should have done, but didn't, and was using his fingernail to uh, press in all the way around the foot until he found a tiny area that probably had a little abscess in it, uh -huh. but it was tiny, but it was so painful, the sheep would not put its foot on the ground. So he gave me anti-inflammatory, uh, painkillers, and um, there was a third one, I can't think what it was. Anyway, I was to inject it with um, the anti-inflammatories uh, and the painkiller, oh, antibiotic. Um, so I was to inject this sheep for the next 10 days to make sure it fully, he said, do it for a week. If it still isn't sound, do it for 10 days. So I did it for the full 10 days and the sheep was here on her own. I, it, there was another sheep to keep her company and her two lambs in a place that I could easily access her because obviously as soon as you start injecting a sheep, they're like, don't get near me. So I'd have to bring her in and put her in a place that I could inject her every day. At the end of the 10 days, she's completely sound. Yay, turn her out with the rest of the flock. Four days later, I'm moving the whole flock into another field. And I look back down the field and I see this one yo with her two lambs and she's not moving. And I'm like, oh, walk down the field. She's on three legs. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this again. I said, right, I am going to just go out and get the, uh, it was late enough in the year that a lot of the uh, herbal things were there. So I went and I got some horse chestnut, which are anti-inflammatory. I got some willow, which is anti-inflammatory and a painkiller. I got some oxide daisies. I got some ivy. I got some other mixed herbs. And I found her in the field every day for the next few days. And I fed her these. And she would eat what she wanted and then move off. Within four days, she was sound. And I was like, why didn't I do that in the first place? I spent the money on the vet, but it was my own doubt in comparison to what a sheep instinctively knows it needs to recover from whatever the health issue is. And so the more I'm learning, as I always say, I am learning every single day new things about what might be an issue or what to feed a sheep when they're feeling a particular way. And that was a huge educational moment for me just this year. It's like trust more in what I've learned over the years of what a sheep seeks out to self-medicate. And voila, I did. And it worked a treat. And this is also feeds to what we said earlier that people have this 
pattern of behavior, right? Oh, you the sheep is, sh I need to get a vet. And then vet does the same thing. Oh, the sheep is back. I got the antibiotics. Da, 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 da. And it is hard to break that and, well, risk it in yeah. a sense, experiment. And then would you be willing to experiment with your sheep like you did? But some people maybe not. Exactly. And this is probably also the barrier that we said earlier of like, oh. Yeah, it's converting to a more natural way of farming. I mean, there are still flocks in France where the sheep farmers there have a side of a mountain. And when they have a worm burden, they bring the sheep to that particular area to graze, to deal with the worm burden. Uh, when they want to fatten them, they bring them there. When they want to do this, they bring them to there. So the shepherds there have an ancient heritage of herbally treating their sheep in a natural way on the hillsides that they graze. And I'm trying to create that here through partially through Cotswold seed and the natural regeneration of the ancient seed bed that all farms have. Um, they have the ancient seed bed of what is native to your area. So I have an area up in the field that is very high in yarrow, for example. It has lots of yarrow, it has lots of other herbs and things like that that have tannins. So if I feel that their sheep are looking a bit wormy or something, I'll put them out there and they'll graze a load of the plants with tannins and hopefully that will deal with the worm burden, which is, as I was saying earlier, was the result of the vet saying, you have no worm parasites. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's how you do it and how you learn to trust in it. And that is really, 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 really hard when you have been fully educated in a particular process and have seen the results, be it one or two or three generations, that it, the, the, the generation of farmers who understood the medicinal hedgerow or the medicinal paddock for their livestock has gone. And that is what we need to get back is to have the medicinal paddock that you put the sick animal out on and it self-medicates. And there was that there were those because those would be where you put the sick animal and in that paddock it would heal. It's kind of a recurring pattern. There's a lot of things that we used to do and we're not doing anymore because of this kind of like a um, industrialization, let's say, came along. It's like, oh, there's like a more effective, easier, quicker way of doing it. But, but where did that industrial, when did that converge? If you think about it, the 1970s, when we had the OPEC oil crisis in the 1970s, a lot of the oil industry said, oh, we have to learn how to make biofuels. So they did huge amounts. I know you don't have fleas, silly cat. The oil industry said, now we have to produce green biofuels, which they did out of maize, soya, and palm oil. Once you've squeezed the oils out to produce the sugars, the proteins, or whatever it is to make the biofuel, what do you do with the leftover dry matter? I'll feed it to the cows. It won't be there rotting in the background. If you look at industrial farming and the OPEC oil or the oil producing companies working on producing green biofuels because of that crisis in the 1970s, you will see the two are very closely linked because it was a waste product. What do we do it? Let's feed it to animals to get rid of it. Was it, was it <gasps> wow, okay? this is a quick way to fatten the beef cows with all this okay, so soil. It was, so it was opportunistic on the, on the uh, farming industry side, let's say. Well, it was probably the oil industry trying to figure out what to do with the waste product. What do you do with the waste product? Yeah. Pile it up high and let it rot down and stink and what a waste. So yeah. let's feed it to a few cattle and see what happens. I don't know. It's, this is, I, I think that if you look at when this in the industrialization of housing livestock and feeding the chickens and the pigs and the cows seems to marry with that explosion in biofuels and the waste product. And that's when also you see the decrease in 
uh, a lot of the soil biome because there's a huge amount of, of 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 tillage crops are funneled straight into um, biofuels. Yeah. It's the maize, the rape, soya, and um, palm oil. A huge percentage of all of those is in biofuels. Hmm. And this is, it, so, you know, it makes it easier to feed a waste product than it is to produce it. Yeah. But then what are the impacts down the line? Down Hugely the line? detrimental. But yeah. see, nobody would have known that, that at the time. Yeah. They were basically solving an energy crisis issue. And in solving the energy crisis issue, they created an unbeknownst to them at the time, probably, they created an additional issue, which yeah. became the industrialization yeah. of um, you know, And you know, and this is something that I that I also uh, spoke with, with my colleague Rob York uh, earlier on, that there has to be this moment of kind of like reconciliation and saying, yes, we went this way because of X, Y, and Z. And that was probably not good. And now we need to move on. Yes. And and uh, what he says that quite often that is missing element. Yes. This kind it of like is, that is a huge missing element. But like I said earlier, farmers are amazingly innovative and when in innovative and when they understand that their soil is the is their livelihood is their next generational thing and they start converting away from industrial farming to look after the soil biome suddenly they're like wow this is amazing i don't have to spend money on herbicide insecticide fungicide fertilizer etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's all intertwined in an, un, an, an understanding the nuance of the environment and how we're killing them. I mean, so if you have fields that have been tilled for the last 60 or 70 years and you go to the edge of the field, you can see how much the soil has changed, has been taken out. Mm -hmm. So the edge of the field is much higher than when you go into the field. Now, when you take all that food or crops off the field, you're not returning any organic matter, you're not turning anything to the soil. So the soil gets depleted, depleted, depleted. It gets less aeration, less filtration, less everything. So it's becoming more and more compacted. And you need the movement of oxygen and water within the soil to for the productive biome. So where is all that water gone? It's gone into the atmosphere. So we are getting more and more violent storms because the balance of where the water is, is imbalanced. If you think of all the Great Plains in the USA where they have these, or Canada or in Brazil or the Pampas in South America or the Plains in Germany or France or the Ukraine, all of that soil is being depleted. So there is less water in the soil and there's more in the atmosphere. When you have more water in the atmosphere, it's more volatile. So how do we return the moisture to the soil? You use the livestock multi-species clover sward rotation of returning the soil biome into something that is digesting the organic matter and holding the water and keeping the water and absorbing the water and the oxygen and the air, etc. And and again, these these are uh, concepts I'm coming from the different different perspective. And when you're walking around your farm, I was talking to you about the. Um, uh, uh, Simon Musto's book, which is like probably a couple episodes back, yeah. where he again talks about how life, wildlife balances the environment in terms of the energy, exactly things that you're saying, where the energy from the sun comes in, how it is, how animals basically distributing it. And like you say, like the energy, the, the water gets just basically in the, in, the, in the wrong place. And this is why it destabilizes the whole system. The, the so it's 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 fascinating us through these conversations, like different points, and this all coming to like a one 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 thing really that that the nature will rebalance itself. But it needs a helping hand. Yeah. We have to help it because we've imbalanced it so badly yeah. that you can't 
allow a monoculture to take over. You can't allow something to, you can't abandon somewhere and let it rewild because we've imbalanced it so much that it can't rebalance in a way that is beneficial to the environment. It needs the animal plant interchange activated to keep going. Because the chaff and the horseshoe, chaff and the horseshoe bat, they need the dung beetle and the dung beetle needs the manure and the manure has the animal and the animal needs the soil and needs the plant. It needs, it's all of those things are so intertwined and we've thrown them out of balance by over plowing and too many novel entities and artificial fertilizers and chemical engineering and all those kind of things has uh destabilized the whole nuance of what a healthy environment is to the point that we are now fighting against each other oh you're doing it wrong you're doing it wrong it's like no 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 relax let's start just at the basics go down to the soil let's work on the soil get the soil right the soil biome right reactivate the natural, healthy, microbial, mycrosial, nematodes, worms, insects in the soil. Once you get that going, everything else will fall into place because it'll absorb the carbon. It'll, the natural methane cycle will occur there. The, the, the plants will sequester the carbon that will rebalance. You know, we've imbalanced the world with too much fossil fuel release, as well as the tillage release of carbons, as well as the water release, uh, all those kind of things. But if we go down, back down to the basic, basic natural floor of the environment and start working with the soil and returning the soil to a healthy soil biome, everything. I got to take you up on the, you, you mentioned rewilding the our oh, yeah. world. So I'm, I'm curious if your comments on the popularity of the movement, is it good? Is it bad? Does it have a place? Oh, it has a place. It definitely has a place, but it is not going to solve the problem because we have imbalanced so much of the environment with the novel entities, with the over-fertilization, with the uh, uh, creation of so many monocultures. It absolutely has a place, but I feel, as do many people, time is of the essence. We need to rebalance the accelerated volatility of the climate change and the climate crisis. And to do that, if we could, to reactivate, there was a very interesting paper, paper I just read recently. When you have a mining, you have the slagging heaps that are chemically toxic and all the rest of it. And um, what he did was to, they tried everything to throwing seed and, and um, uh, potting soil and compost and all these kind of things onto these slagging heaps. Nothing resuscitated it. So this one farmer took it upon himself and he started farming it with cattle and multi-species sword and mob grazing them so that the cattle would be grazing and moved like every, I think he started off with a couple of hours and then it became shorter and shorter so that there was an intense amount of the cow's internal biome, microbial, microbial life was shat into the soil and it reactivated the soil so that he created a thriving biodiverse area of these slag heaps using the cow as a tool. And when I have friends in the US who have had to go and rescue rewilded places because the the people had said, oh, well, it will reactivate itself, but we have too many invasive species now 
all over the world in different climates from where they tr have their traditional predators and everything, that we as humans have to actually step in and kind of manage the rewilding. And this friend of mine, there are times when they have to introduce goats, cows, and horses to reactivate and to stabilize the rewild place from becoming a monoculture. So in the U.S., there is a thing called kudzu vine, which takes off and it suppresses everything. And you you end up having the kudzu vine over everything. So if you move in with the horses and the cattle and the sheep, they'll graze the kudzu vine out, but they'll also stimulate the growth uh, between because of their movement of their hooves yes. to activate the old seed bank. And they will resuscitate a rewilded place from a monoculture into a biodiverse location. And uh, I was walking you through our woods today and I was showing you uh, one half of the, one area of the woodland where I use the sheep to go in and graze the um, understory. And then I showed you the other area that just had the ivy. And that's to show you the understory where the sheep graze every once in a while uh, is active to feed wildlife uh, both flora and fauna uh, throughout the year, whereas the other area of woodland was just carpet and ivy and you didn't see much biodiversity Yeah, because the plant life was suppressed by the monoculture of ivy. I have nothing against ivy, but it is one of those things that you don't want to allow to become a monoculture. Um, you want to encourage the holly, uh, which flowers and seeds or does it seeds at the same time as ivy does so you're not canceling out you're adding in biodiversity and so rewilding and leaving something or abandoning it to its own devices to rejuvenate a woodland using its own devices will not now work because there's too many invasive species which can take over and monoculture us like the um the uh what is it called the balsam the um oh what is that plant called that's invasive here in ireland uh himalayan balsam i think it's called and you want to get rid of that you don't want to leave it alone because what happens is all the pollinators prefer it to their native species so they all fly to the Himalayan balsam and feed and feed and feed. And all the native species are like, aha, wait, we need to produce seeds to keep going. We're a biannual. We need, we need you. But the pollinators are yeah. ignoring them. Yeah. So you, you, we as humans sadly have done such environmental damage to the point that we now have to help. I'm not saying we have to control every aspect at all. We can't because we only know a teaspoon of what makes it all work. No, I agree with that. We cannot be just like a tools down. No. Because, because uh, and again, that's a conversation that we had earlier, that na nature doesn't care and it will rebalance itself, but it might not be exactly what we think or what we want this to, to rebalance. It may rebalance itself into monoculture, or maybe, like I always say, it maybe needs like 20 million years to rebalance itself into the sun. And we don't have that time. Well, but yes, that's... This is the thing is where we need to have the herbivores, be it a horse, cow, sheep, uh, goat, uh, within a holistically managed fashion to activate the soil and keep a kind of balance because you need the dung beetles. Dung beetles are so vital to soil health. The only countries I think that don't have dung beetles are um, the two Arctics uh, and a couple of the northern, you know, kind of very frozen areas. Some of them have dung beetles. Um, Australia, they had to introduce dung beetles because the fly problem was so bad that they were using so much insecticide, it just wasn't working. So they introduced the dung beetles and their fly problem disappeared. You know, they uh, with the beanie yeah, caps, yeah, yeah, with the yeah, corks yeah. to keep the flies yeah, yeah, away? Yeah, yeah. Well, they introduced and started breeding dung beetles. And the fly issue, it's still bad, but it's not as bad as it was when they had no dung beetles there. How come? Because the dung beetle and the mite eat the uh, fly, egg, and larvae, just like they eat the worm, parasitic worm, egg, and larvae. So the answers are there in nature. 
It's just how we companionably help manage it to move it forward. One other question on the on the rewilding front that I got to ask you because you're a sheep farmer. And that yes. question is about the carnivores and reintroductions of carnivores. Caveat, I'm not talking about just dropping a bunch of wolves to to as we as we have, right? Yeah. Saying it's a it's a project done somewhat properly, m- meaning you got to have a suitable habitat you need to because, you know, there's this this issue of like, okay, you can just put a lynx or wolves, but are they going to be fulfilling their ecological role or are they just going to be scavenging, you know, the trash bins because, and surprisingly that in itself turns out to be controversial sometimes because there are people who say like, well, that's their environmental, that's their ecological role now. Well, yes, but in the environment full of trash bins. But anyway, the, the, the point is what are your views on, on the potential reintroductions on the importance of the lack of of having carnivores on the landscape also from the perspective that you're a sheep farmer so obviously if that happened you would need to take into account some losses and be dealing with that curious of your views on that i've lived and worked on farms in the usa pumas coyotes bears i've chased black bears away on horseback from freshly calved cows uh, that was an amazing experience in of itself. Watching a yeah, brown bear jumping a fence is that, just that sounds yeah cool. <laughs> it was it was it was yeah me galloping on a horse flat out after a bear that was pulling away, and you're like wow that bear is fast. Um, hearing the cougars mm-hmm. coming back into the mountains and dealing with the coyotes. Now a lot of people in the United States have livestock protector dogs. Those livestock protector dogs uh, will kill a domestic dog as much as they will a wolf or a coyote. Which is, which is, uh, I guess, okay because there's a lot of attacks on the no, domestic. No, hang dogs. on a sec. Hang on a sec. Oh, they protect you have, livestock. You, but they will also, to protect their livestock, they will attack humans as well because they're invading the space of the livestock. So a lot of livestock farmers in the U.S. have to put signposts everywhere, livestock protecting dogs. So if you're hiking in that area, you do not want to come across those livestock dogs because they could attack you and your domestic dog that you have on lead or off lead. They're doing their job. They're doing their job. Now, here in Ireland, with the insurance and liability clauses, if you're going to introduce wolves or lynx, or whatever, back into Ireland, you have to address the insurance clauses that prevent the farmer from being liable for their livestock dog attacking humans or pet dogs. At the moment, the insurance industry in this country, that farmer is liable and can be sued if you walk across their farm and break your leg. Yeah, that's crazy to me. So if they have to have livestock dogs to protect their animals from the wolf or the lynx or the coyote or or the brown bear or whatever, you have to change the insurance industry so that that farmer is protected. All those people who want to rewild and reintroduce want to go wild hiking. Go wild hiking do you know what a wolf does? That, do you know what a bear does? But that's that that is that is very that is very interesting point. Like I I talk a lot about the rewilding, but no one ever brought the insurance aspect, liability, liability and insurance aspect of it. Because you're right, it's like oh, there are measures to protect the livestock, guarding dogs. There are guard dogs. Okay, yeah, but we want to write to ac- write access right to Rome. Okay, go and roam right into that place when the livestock protecting dog is protecting livestock. Hello? <laughs> and you know <laughs> this is, this in Europe, in Europe, they have signs up that say livestock dogs at work. They attack people just as much as they attacked the wolves, the coyote, the lynx, the bear, to keep them away. Yeah. That's why those dogs 
when you see them have spiky collars because when they're fighting with the lynx, the wolf, or the bear, yes. they need the spiky collar to protect themselves. Yes, so the so the so bear or the wolf. So if you're hiking, yeah. you hear of people hiking and saying, "Oh, these dog ran off to attack me," and it was like you were trespassing across his flock or herd of animals, and he was doing his job. So before you introduce any top predators back into the wild in Ireland, you have to address the insurance industry and policy who is liable for you walking across that field when that dog attacks you. This is, this is fantastic. I never, that never came up, but it's a very good point. This is a very good point. And it never if comes up. If I can up, have it never, the it never comes up because people don't look at the whole picture of the farmer's point of view. They're just looking at the farmer saying, oh, but my livestock, my livestock will all be eaten. Okay. We will pay for you to have livestock dogs. Who's going to pay for the people being bitten by the livestock dogs or being sued because the livestock dog killed their German shepherd because it wandered into the flock? Who is going to do that? The Irish government is not going to fund or protect the farmers who are protecting their flock when their livestock dogs are attacking the humans or the rewilding people walking across their land and their dogs. <laughs> You're, you, just, you just give like a fresh perspective. I never heard that before. Uh, and, and it's a very good one. It only goes to show how complex... Uh, Everything is environmentally... There is so much nuance and complexity. It, there is no black and white. Mm. If anybody thinks it's black and white, they are deceiving themselves and those around them. And we have to remember that a lot of science is to pro is is and research is done to solve a problem. But what created that problem in the first place? Mm -hmm. It was another problem which created another problem, which created another problem. So you're dealing with a more narrower and narrower field of vision in what that science is, pr pr uh, is pursuing to solve. Let's go backwards and see what created the problem that created the problem that created the problem. And you're going to go right back to the soil. The soil, returning the soil to a healthy soil biome. When we do that, agriculturally, environmentally, socially, psychologically, all those kind of things will help fall into place. It's great. And I completely agree with that. Uh, we're going to put links. I'm going to put the links in the show notes to your website so people can find more about you. Oh, well, you the, the, the website is for sales of my blankets and yarn. My YouTube channel has a lot more of me daily farming and pointing and your things YouTube, out. And your yeah. YouTube channel. Uh, so, but before we wrap this up, I want you to uh, give our listeners some of the words of wisdom. Maybe not farmers, but people who are listening to this and they have this moment like, oh yeah, how do I, you know, they would be, like to do something for themselves and for the environment. What would be your advice for like a regular folks who are just very, you know, not, not deep my, into these things? My advice would be to... Find farmers who are farming with the environment and producing it food, fruit, vegetable, meat, any of those kind of things in an environmentally friendly manner and spend your money on them because you are getting nutritious food as well. And, you know, over processed foods, you know, try and minimize those because that's the food industry that is not environmentally friendly because it is a commodity. <laughs> our food is our health. Our soil is our health. And I think if you really want to support the environment is to find those farmers and they're out there and they're all over the place. I, I agree with that. And, and on top of that, I go and meet that farmer. And meet the farmer the, and talk to them. Yeah. They're, 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 you know, I yet, yet meet, meet the farmer who would not like to talk to you. And, and, and I have tour groups coming through. I have cooking tour groups, student tour groups, yeah. knitting tour groups, environmentalist tour, farm tour groups, all coming through and having these conversations yeah. with them. And it's like, I mean, one of my favorite analogies is that I'm like throwing the pebble out in the pond mm -hmm. and watching the ripple effect. And the more ripples we can create 
about the importance of the soil biome and the health of it, the better for all of us. Susanna, you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you for that. And thank you for this interview. You're most welcome anytime. <laughs> thank you.